From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control, Deck, and most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. We're finally doing it. Uh, this is our episode about chips, and and thank goodness because uh, we talk about yum, yum. T- yeah we talk about chips a lot off air. What, what do you, um, we were talking about an Instagram ad that some of us have been getting for very very strange potato chips recently. Strange and exotic potato chips. Yeah, I think both you and I, Ben, have received one for a Lay's shabu shabu hot pot flavor, mm-hmm. which seems delightful. And of course, you know, you and I, uh, I think all four of us frequent. Asian supermarkets quite a lot, like the Super H Marts of the world, and there you'll see this insane variety of chips that you just don't get in your, you know, humble Kroger or Publix or whatever, but... uh Ah, uh, we're not really talking about those kind of chips today, though, are we? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I guess we should we should rip off the band aid now. Uh, Ow! <laughs> chips are amazing, uh, potato chips in particular. But there's another kind of chip that we're going to explore tonight. It is the kind of chip that makes civilization as we know it possible in the first place. These chips are often referred to as semiconductors. Think of them as the silent servants of the digital age, depending upon whom you ask, they may just trigger the next world war. Here are the facts. Before we get any further, what is a semiconductor? This is the land of no dumb questions. Well, uh, speaking of that, let's let's just do a little upfront information here for everybody listening. Uh, your boy, Matt, is a dumb dumb and did all of his research on LK99 superconductor stuff that was going on in the news. I literally, mm. I don't know where I w- crossed my sem- my semiconductors, guys, but I totally, like, I have no idea what's going on in this episode, so I'm going to be just completely, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm lost. Sorry, Surely guys. Surely that knowledge will come in handy somewhere down the I line. I don't think though, it right? will. I don't think no, it will. Never? <laughs> right. no. I, I, I think it will, but, but like, okay, before we get into semiconductors, man, tell, tell us a little bit about the LK99, because that news sort of rocked, rocked the digital world, uh, a few weeks back. Sure. Well, uh, today the news came out that uh, officially uh, people who've been trying to replicate this super, this room temperature superconductor technology, the, it came back and they said, no, it's not actually a superconductor. It does have really cool things going on about it, uh, but it's not a room temperature superconductor, which would, would have changed the game for everything, including and especially chips and semiconductors. Um, uh, so anyway, we, let's get into the episode and talk about semiconductors. I apologize, guys. I, I guess that begs the question. We're talking about, first and foremost, the idea of conductivity, you know, and what does it mean? You know, I mean, not, not to, you know, state the obvious, but, you know, conducting s- materials are able to allow electricity to pass through them and can be used for all things like wiring and, you know, send, you know, there are materials that are conductive where it's not a good thing, you know, you could, it could be dangerous, you know, and you have to be very careful about, you know, having electricity around pools, <laughs> like, you know, don't, don't dry, blow dry your hair in the bathtub and keep the toaster far, far away. Cause that's a recipe for disaster. Um, but the idea of like something that conducts better or less better. Well, and- <laughs> Yeah, don't whiz yeah. on the electric fence <laughs> that because too. of conductors. Yeah, does, does urine conduct electricity? It's got electrolytes in it, right? Would you, would you, if you really whizzed on the electric fence, would you get zapped? I mean, it's not a good idea, right? Probably not, uh, because we know yeah. we know water can conduct electricity, and urine is, you know, urine's like Lacroix; it's water with a little something extra. Um, I don't know if Lacroix wants us to, to portray them that way, but on on the other end of the spectrum, there's the insulators, right? Like right. glass is an insulator. Uh, yeah, yeah. Electricity doesn't really vibe with those. So when 
Uh, it was funny, we were talking off air just before we recorded about semiconductor. Um, it, why, why would you want something that is in this Goldilocks zone between insulation and uh, superconductivity? Well, it's because it allows you to control the flow. It, it lets you put some, uh, lets you put some if thens, some ones and zeros into the mix. And as you're listening to tonight's show, there are billions of little semiconductor ones and zeros making this possible. Even if it doesn't sound like a bunch of ones and zeros, everything you do electronically is that. I, I was sort of made the comment off mic that uh, the name semiconductor almost sounds kind of like a bit of a self own where it's like, I'm not that good at conducting electricity. I'm only semi good at it. But that, that matters because we want to be able to, as you said, Ben, kind of stem the flow of electricity in ways that are conducive to certain technological processes, you yeah. know, and those those billions of uh, switches, I guess, the ones and zeros, the if-thens, that's what's so important. All of that's contained within this tiny little piece of uh, real estate. Yeah. Oh, and, and that tiny real estate, and then let's go back to what, Ben, you were saying about conductors and in insulators and semiconductors. The problem with uh, metal like copper, or even when you get into things like silicon, when you pump electrons through there, let's say in copper, electrons are just going willy-nilly everywhere throughout that those atoms of that copper. The electrons, you go in, it goes everywhere. That's why you get resistance. That's why you get heat in anything, right? Like uh, we were just talking about um, my computer is being so hot, I've been having these recording problems. It's because this thing is generating a ton of heat, which is just the resistance, the electricity lost basically due to the materials used in the creation of this machine. Um, and that's why. And over time, it's gotten less efficient, I guess, or the the the, the battery has, has lost some of its original oomph. And now it's sort of like generating way more of that than it should. And which is why it's time to put that thing out to pasture. Well, it's also because the semiconductors that were manufactured back in 2012, 2013, you know, were of a certain grade and they degrade over time, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, so the question is, of course, uh, coming from a culture where bigger, better, faster is always superior, it might seem counterintuitive to have something less conductive, but having a semiconductor material because of the way resistance works, it allows humans to make amplifiers. It allows humans to make switches. And um, shout out to a uh, professor of electrical engineering at Arizona State University, Trevor Thornton, uh, has a great explainer on this with the good folks at the conversation. And Thornton puts it this way. He breaks down the chips in a very understandable way. He says, these chips are typically made from thin slices of silicon, and they have complex components laid out in specific patterns. These patterns control the flow of current using those switches we're talking about, transistors. And uh, Thornton says, it's pretty much the same way you control the electrical current in your home. The light switch is a literal switch, right? Turn off or on the, um, the flow of the electricity. But the difference between the switches in our houses and the switches in a semiconductor is that those semiconductor switches are first off very, very tiny and uh, they're entirely electrical. They need no mechanical components to flip. And there are billions of switches, tens of billions in the sophisticated chips. And this is an area like not much bigger than your thumbnail, not even, no, your thumbnail is probably your best fingernail, not much bigger than your pinky nail. And that's the part where I just my mind just kind of glazes over where I'm like, this just for all intents and purposes might as well be alien tech to me. Like, I understand a circuit and, and the basics of electronics, you know, and like the if then of like a basic printed circuit board, like in a piece of musical equipment, for example. And, and oftentimes those will incorporate switches, you know, to turn a thing on or off, whether it be blocking a signal path, you know, or, or like whatever, or turning on a certain filter or whatever it might be. But this whole billions of switches in an area not much larger than the size of a fingernail is just I, I can't wrap my head around it. It makes me think, you know, at some point, 
Well, at some point, there will be a physical limit to how many switches can be put onto a a single chip. When you get to the when you get down to a single atom size, right now you can't you can't go much smaller. But if we could, eventually, you could you you might be able to make so many switches that you can make a simulation of the entire observable universe. I am not high, by the way. I, well, I'm not either <laughs> yet, um, but I have to say too. Like, I mean, is this is this is the amount of these switches, the number or whatever that has to do with how many processes a, uh, a chip can do at one time. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about evolution of chips over time. These things, I think they're called threads or whatever. Like within a computer processor, the 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 higher power chips, the higher power processors can do more of this, can contain more of these switches. I'm just again, I'm. I'm conjecturing. I'm pretty sure that's right, though. A hundred percent. For a long time, people were following something called Moore's Law. And Moore's Law is this stunning observation that the number of switches or transistors in an integrated circuit doubles or has doubled every two years. It's a, it's a stunning and precipitous evolution. Not, not all of these chips are the same. We can think of rough categories. Memory chips, they store data and software as binary code. Digital chips, they manipulate the data based on instructions from software. And then wireless chips receive data from high-frequency radio transmitters, convert those into electrical signals, and then it's back to the chips. This is all run by the language of software. All software does, even the very advanced stuff, it just coordinates the ways in which these different chips work together. Would that include things like RF, uh, you know, using your phone to tap on a thing to, you know, pay or mm-hmm. like the way you're receiving or transmitting short distance kind of data? Yeah, man, it's it's pretty much it, it's actually it's weird. Uh, <laughs> it's almost easier at this point, I think, to try and name electronics without these sorts of chips because they're in everything, your phone, your car, your TV, remote medical applications, military applications. Uh, Back in the day, semiconductor chip evolution moved with the cycles of PCs. So the more personal computers improved, the more sophisticated they became, the more sophisticated chips became. And then iPhones hit. iPhones were a big game changer. At this point, I think we should shout out our pal uh, Jonathan Strickland, aka The Quister from Tech Stuff. Uh, He's had one of the longest running tech podcasts in the game. uh, And he explains this stuff in depth. If you want a less conspiratorial primer, um, but when like you, you hear said, the phrase smart device, that means yes. there's one, some, some of this stuff in them and that's literally yeah. smart. Anything. Yeah. Right. Your, right. your, your thermostat, what, mm-hmm. your washer and dryer, Refrigerator. Your, yeah, everything, mm-hmm. <laughs> your, your massage chair. Uh, <laughs> so, so the wireless chip is also, again, I'm sorry to, to be beating this in the ground, but like, that's what allows you to, to receive Wi-Fi. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, and so many of these smart devices have to be on a network and don't have an ethernet port on them. So that's the kind of chip we're talking about here. Probably in addition to the digital chip, maybe not memory chip. I don't know. Memory chip is more like RAM on a computer for temporary storage of data that's actually being used in in the moment. They all work together, and that's it, right. What's What's nuts about it too is if you think about uh, let's let's blow the dust off our old Taco Bell analogy. From these basic ingredients, you can make a panoply of things that appear to be very different items on the menu. Right. Taco Bell is like famous for having, what, four to five ingredients and they'll sell you 30 things. That's kind of how chips work. And Mm. so, but in the the, end, isn't it weird? And I'm not high to think that all of this, (laughs) all of the information, it's just an electrical current getting Mm -hmm. taken in different directions and and hitting different things at different times. And at all micro level, it becomes our voices in your ears. Mm -hmm. Pew, pew, pew. Yeah. It becomes your favorite television show on Max or whatever. Like, that, oh. Well, the human brain is that, too. I'm looking at a, a, a very simple piece of electronics right next to me that's a monophonic synthesizer that is just signal flowing, electricity that is filtered and, and boosted and the different things that happen to it, and it makes a sound. And that is literally a sound that we hear that is just vibrations carried on the air. You know, all, I mean, yes, sorry, Matt, it is mind blowing. Also, um, I, I got to say on a soft note, folks, um, fellow conspiracy realist, 
and also Paul, because Paul, you're listening along here. Uh, it, it might sound a little weird that we all three took a moment to say, we're not high as individuals, <laughs> but that's just because this stuff is so mind blowing when you think about it. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's, it, it, it breaks your head, right? Um, so we, we know this evolution is nuts. If you are a, um, a fellow nerd of a certain generation, your first experience with semiconductors may have come in the form of pocket calculators. Remember those old Texas Instruments things we all had to buy? What a monopoly. That was a grift. <laughs> yeah, I didn't learn until pretty recently how important Texas Instruments was in the whole personal computer Huge. race. You know, mm. There's a really great show called Halt and Catch Fire that's sort of like a fictionalized version of like the race for like the PC and the laptop and stuff. And parts of it are real. And one part of it that's real is the whole inclusion of, of Texas Instruments. And they called it the Silicon Prairie, that area. Area of, uh, of Texas that was really big in this stuff. Um, really, really fascinating. Even before, like, you know, Silicon Valley became a thing, Texas was kind of like the ground zero for a lot of this, uh, this, this research and development. Yeah. And, and we've already clocked the, uh, the substance silicon coming up again and again. That'll oh, yeah. be important. We're, we're going somewhere with this, folks. Those, those pocket calculators, like you mentioned, Matt, like the TI 85s and so on. 83. 84s. 83. 83 was the one. I okay. had Snake. Remember you could put Snake games on Snake was so dope. Drug yeah. Wars. <laughs> drug Wars. Drug, I was about to say, Drug <laughs> Wars. played Drug Wars? It was just a text-based, like, yeah. choose your own adventure yeah. game. That's all it was, and you got to be a drug kingpin. And mm. I remember it was the first time I saw the word ludes, and I was like, what is lo- What are ludes? <laughs> I don't know what this is. I also remember the old uh, 8005 trick, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. It was it was boobs. <laughs> Take that Shakespeare. <laughs> so uh, those things only had a few thousand transistors per chip. Still very impressive for us. But now the largest ones are going to have more than fifty billion transistors, pushing to the edge of Moore's laws. Uh, and you know, naturally, okay. So this is one of the most important technologies in modern civilization. Who makes them? Uh, this is where it gets interesting. They're made at these compounds called foundries. Back in 2000, about 23 years ago, there were something like 23 companies that were doing this to some degree. As of 2021, there were only three major players in the game. As, uh, as the free market dictates, they ate their own, right? And there were fewer and fewer competitors. Um, the, the, three big, the three big boys, the three chonkers in the field are Intel, Yoohoo, Go US. Uh, Samsung, dong, 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 dong. <laughs> right? of, yeah, out of Korea. I think that's yeah. the one. That's yeah. A, yeah, and then uh, something called Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, or TSMC. This is the Kobe Bryant of the game by far. Interesting. Yeah, but that one sort of seems to be. It, I don't know. We'll get there if it's changed names, but I don't know that as a household name like I do Intel. You know, mm. um, I do think it's funny too, or interesting that the term foundry, like that's a really old term for like a place where you would pour metal, molten steel and things and like, you know, make goods out of liquid metal, a foundry, like picture where the Terminator gets lowered into the, the lava at the end of T2 spoiler alert for a 25 year old movie. <laughs> well, well, let's, uh, let's stay Thumbs up. Let, let's talk about that one. The Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company. Uh, it's in Taiwan, and they make, what is it? It's over half of all the chips manufactured in the world, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, around about 54% currently. And additionally, out of all the chips they make, and out of all the chips in the world, TSMC makes the best ones, the most sophisticated ones. When we're talking about the the, the new ones with 50 billion switches or transistors, those are coming from Taiwan. And there are other players in the game. But at present, if this one company goes under or its operations are disrupted for any amount of time, for any reason, the world as you know it, folks, is going to run into a lot of problems very, very quickly. So, um, okay. You know, uh, diversification is good in any field, but sometimes you can't have it, right? Sometimes you have to live with a reality. And if Taiwan is indeed the holy grail for, or the holy font for this technology, then I guess humans have to take care of Taiwan. But 
That's kind of complicated because it turns out Taiwan is a little bit more than a dope archipelago of sci-fi technology. Well, yeah, it's also uh, a very, let's say, important and strategic geopolitical location. How about we call it that? <laughs> and, and I mean, really, think about that. We're we're not joking when we say most things now that you can purchase that are above bargain basement, like the lowest level version of a product, have a chip in it, just as a standard, and they are making 54% of those chips that go in all of the things. It's not an internet of things, it's a world of internet things. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if you ask any geopolitics wonk, any economist, any war hawk, you know, even if you get the buttoned up alphabet boys about three drinks in and you ask them uh, <laughs> what's, what will lead to World War III, they're going to have a short list of things. And it's going to be stuff like climate refugees. It's going to be stuff like um, nuclear accountability, potable water, and Taiwan. Because if things, go, uh, if things go just a little bit wrong, Taiwan is going to be a huge problem. What do we mean? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsors. Here's where it gets crazy. A war for chips. Could World War III break out over Taiwan? The answer, unfortunately, is yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, it's like a devil's bargain, right? You know, you, you, you make all this progress, you know, m surrounding this miraculous material that has a shelf life, I guess, or there is a finite amount of the stuff and it's not just available anywhere. And, you know, you basically hang your entire existence on this substance, on this material. And then uh, there becomes, it becomes the most, talk about chips. It's a bargaining chip. It becomes the most outrageous bargaining chip you could possibly imagine. Yeah. It's in it, the scary part is, um, you, even if you don't hear about it often, if you're not in the tech sector or the war sector, there is already a war going on. It's a cold war for now. Um, as we record, the West is throwing economic sanctions. China's throwing economic sanctions. A lot of people are making big speeches and posturing. They're doing trade freezes that are specifically targeting the supply chain of semiconductors. Stuff that's so specific, it would sound weird. Like, why is the U.S. terrified that China is clamping down on things like gallium? When's the last time you, you were walking down the street and you thought, oh, I wonder how gallium's doing or germanium? And, and Ben, I, I made the comment earlier that TSMC wasn't like a household name to me, you know, and I think that's true. But this still is this is the important you know, component of this conversation is that company. And the fact that they're not a household name is interesting. Mm -hmm. They're selling. Yeah. You're not going to, you're not going to buy their high end chips as an individual. You're going to buy stuff from companies like Apple that have bought chips from that company. They supply other businesses and governments and militaries. I mean, it sounds alarmist, right? But in recent years, the idea of a chip war has become a big, big concern in the U.S. Like, people stay awake at night worried about this uh, because the PRC has a really fraught, cartoonishly tense relationship with Taiwan, and they are super duper sensitive about it. Like, e even on this little podcast, this little free podcast, if you uh, if you're not diplomatic when you talk about Taiwan, it can spell problems for you in customs in, in mainstream China, like to the point where they might let you in. But getting out becomes a conversation that you don't want to have. It's it's tough. I mean, like, OK, a, a war could break out at any given moment over any given thing. That's just the reality. Human civilization is a house of cards. But this thing these chips, because the world is so dependent upon them, they may be the proverbial feather on the camel's back. The war might go hot because of this resource. Dude, like, I had no idea, speaking of TSMC, I had no idea just how important they are to the nation of Taiwan. The street name for TSMC 
is Sacred Mountain. And it's such a big deal that if you work for this company, you can apply to be exempted from military training, even if there's a, a war going on. You can say, ah, I work for the chip company, though. And they're like, oh, crap, man, what are you doing here? Get back to the foundry. Make more chips. Well, yeah, it makes sense. If you're a war, you got to make war stuff and war stuff needs to be smart. And if you don't have the chips, then you don't got the war stuff. <laughs> right. Which I think is the motto of TSMC, right? That's their. Yep. That's like their Intel bump. <laughs> yep. So I guess we need to talk a little bit about um, the situation between China and Taiwan. Why is it so tense? Why? Um, why is it so? I, I think it's fair to say it can seem cartoonish to outsiders. Yeah, I've I've always had a sort of a vague grasp on this, but so I'm, I'm super interested in getting a little more into the details of the history there. Well, look, I'll I'll break down just what I think I know, and then Ben, you you swoop in. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll three blind mice this one, man, <laughs> okay. because we are we are not Taiwanese nor Chinese, and oh oh sorry, we are not Chinese, is what we should say. Yep, because uh, the country of China, the People's Republic of China, has for a long time considered Taiwan just to be China. And with the one China policy, everything that is China is China, and that is it. End of sentence. So Taiwan is China. It is a part of China. Except. Right? <laughs> Except, yeah. <laughs> but the human beings that actually run Taiwan disagree with that sentiment. Is that roughly what's yeah, going on? Yeah, nailed it. That's and and that's the right way to put it. So you'll hear uh, you'll hear it called Taiwan China, Taiwan Province of China, or Taipei China. Uh, it dates back to 1949. There were um, there were two political entities with the name China. They both laid claim to the entirety of the land. The one, uh, the PRC, the People's Republic of China, that's usually what folks in the West mean when they say China. It's mainland China. And then on Taiwan, there was the Republic of China or ROC, which is a very bad thing to say. Don't, you know, don't bring that up in Beijing, even if you think you're chilling and everyone's cool at the karaoke spot. Because of that split, the PRC, like like you guys, like you said, the PRC considers Taiwan one hundred percent part of its country, the way that the U.S. considers Hawaii a hundred percent part of the U.S. And like you said, a lot of people in Taiwan do not agree with that. And if it if this was not a pot, a real possible cause for World War Three. It would be hilarious. The whole like Vonnegut, Joseph Heller-esque catch 22-ness of it. Every single country on the planet pretty much avoids talking about this issue. Sometimes a Western politician will show their ass a little bit and then they immediately step it back because China does not play with this. You can even see, this is so weird to me, you can even see uh, celebrities Totally not politicians, totally not diplomats or anything, just celebrities, your favorite athletes and movie stars, screwing up, having a slight accidental misspeak, and apologizing to the world for daring to refer to Taiwan as some sort of independent country or entity. Um, we have a clip of John Cena doing it. We can play that, right? Can we play this? Is he Surely. speaking in Mandarin? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's play it. Who knew? <laughs> okay, we're playing the clip. Nihao Zhongguo, just a Jiao Xina, or B. Su Shua Shenzai, Zai Sudu Yuji Ching Jo, Wodzo Hundo Saifang, Hundo Hundo Hundo. So, uh, for anybody not speaking Mandarin, what John Cena is doing here, in actually not terrible Mandarin, is apologizing to the world to the people and government of China uh, for accidentally referring to Taiwan as a country. And this is not the only example of this. There are other celebrities who have done the same thing. And why is that important to um, play nice with this government if you are a celebrity or public figure? Well, it's because it's one of the biggest growing 
consumer markets on the planet. That's why your favorite film studios are jumping through their butts <laughs> to to get to get um, the Chinese government's permission to show their films. Right. That's why, like in. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of alone in this, but I loved the Pacific Rim films. Remember? Giant Me too. Kaiju. No, I like I they're good. Giant robots. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, I, I loved them. And you can really tell that, they, that the studios wanted the approval of the Chinese government in, um, in the second Pacific Rim film because there's this whole thing about Charlie Day not being able to speak Mandarin, but trying. There, there's the insertion of this whole uh, Chinese government subplot as like the good guys who actually save the world. There's, there's a lot of play here. And the main thing is, no matter how powerful you are as a government or as a company or even as a billionaire, you just don't talk about the Taiwan thing. You just don't bring it up. It's like if you're at your friend's house and you see them yell at their kids, you just... Don't comment on it. Well, there's even been at least one UN resolution that like tried to set this in stone, or maybe China tried to set it in stone through the UN. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they've got because China, um, as a result of World War II being on the winning side, China is one of the few countries with a veto power, right? Uh, and the United Nations had this white paper that came out and they were of the legal opinion that Taiwan is a province of China with absolutely no separate status. And China took that and ran with it. So our, our stage is set. One of the most important technologies, probably the most important technology in the modern world is manufactured in a ticking time bomb of, of an Island, right? The situation in Taiwan is, Full stop, no caveats. It is unsustainable. It is double plus ungood. It's like if all the world's important computers were made on a glacier and the glacier was melting. I, I guess my question, though, is like, is, is it about their access to the material? Is it about their expertise in manufacturing the product? Like, why do they have such a monopoly on it? Like, why isn't it more diversified? The latter, it's um, it's their expertise in manufacturing um, the materials that are used to make this stuff that goes to Taiwan, but they don't uh, you're not going to see a bunch of like gallium, germanium and um, silicon mines on Taiwan, but they have, they have so. the know how. Yeah. yeah they so have they, the so it's proprietary. Like, so when we get advances in the chip, it's because they figured it out mm-hmm. or what? Yeah, it's just really, really difficult to to make things with that level of precision. Yeah, and, and don't forget, there are people at Intel and you know all these other places that do manufacture chips just on a much smaller scale. They are also attempting to make innovations, right? Uh, both in materials and in in I guess technique. Um, yeah, but this whole thing really does, and we've talked about this before, but it really does give a perfect explanation. For the country of China's practices of resource extraction, specifically in Africa, of like where the materials are coming from and where they are going. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, credit where it's due, a lot of companies that are not in Taiwan, right, Um, like companies in the Netherlands and Japan and the U.S., they have the design know-how. So the boffins over at Intel can design a new chip. And they can have that conceptual breakthrough, but for it to be manufactured, it is overwhelmingly likely it will have to be manufactured in Taiwan. That's the choke point. And um, and it's a choke point that comes in a bad time. Uh, the U.S. and China are, <laughs> oh, they're not friends. They're, they're, they're not friends. They're two people in a crowded restaurant who are increasingly side-eyeing each other. And they're making these little moves that they can't really get in trouble for yet. Uh, it's a huge technological arms race. Um, and, and U.S. companies have a big, big dilemma. They need China. They need but, it. 
But China needs the companies too. Yes. I mean, we're the big, we're a big client. You know, They're, the money's coming from these companies using their products. So it is. It's it's. You're right. It's like this kind of like mannered sort of cold war. You know, where everyone's just sort of like, let's not rock the boat too much. We don't have to like each other, but we also have to figure out how to keep doing business. Mm, yeah. Well, well said. It's kind of weird. Okay, so when I think about it. And I may be way off here. I don't have stats or anything, but it feels as though the U.S. companies like your Apples and well, I guess Samsung is not a U.S. company, but your Apples and the U.S. markets for products being produced by those companies is has been huge historically. Right. Lots Mm -hmm. of that. But it's not as though it's a growing market. Right. Because the U.S., has a certain number of people who are going to buy, let's say, a cell phone at a certain rate, you know, every couple of years or something. Uh, You've got, you know, computers and cars and all these other things, like major things, even appliances that use these chips. There's, you've got a set rate pretty much with a population that is mildly growing, but not enough that it's, you know, going to change the world of the number of chips you need to manufacture for them. But if you've got a, well, again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it feels like uh, the country of China with a population it has country of like India and the population it has. And as the number of people uh, buying new products increases in those countries, that was, that's probably one of the biggest places that they're concerned about when it comes to new manufacturing. Yeah, yeah, very well put, Matt. I I would agree with that because if you want to make money from the Western perspective, you need to be selling things in India and in China. You know, they've they've got this exploding middle class. There's more money to burn than there was historically, uh, and they will they will have that jump in consumption. Uh, the U.S. and a lot of other countries in a similar boat, uh, their populations are undergoing a graying out, right? Even with immigration, uh, things are leveling off. Um, the most apparent example would, of course, be the nation of Japan, right? Which is going to have a lot of problems on the way. China may encounter some of those same demographic challenges uh, as the bill of the one-child policy comes due in future generations and all the uh, femicide it led to, infanticide of women. But right now, China does need the U.S. The question is, for how long will they need the U.S.? As their own domestic market grows, uh, they have increasingly, uh, the PRC has increasingly put in strict rules about how foreign companies can operate in their territory. And this leads to sky-high rates of industrial espionage, at least if you listen to every government except for the government of China. Hmm. And this isn't new. Like, I, 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 th- I may have mentioned this before, but like uh, there's a synthesizer that I have that's made by a, a Japanese company called Roland. And the chips on it that are like they're notorious for going bad and you have to re- re- repair them, replace them. But the reason they go bad is because they have this kind of like coating on the top of them, like surrounding them, covering the chip part where you can actually see, you know, remember those shapes we're talking about or mm-hmm, those, mm-hmm. you know, whatever, like the the path or whatever, they are manufactured with those on it. Then it has to, then in order to repair them, you have to soak them in acetone for like a day and then it dissolves it. But the reason for that is to prevent industrial espionage. No because way. if you have someone, yeah, wow. to, to looking at them coming down the line, they mm-hmm. can't take a picture of what the circuit looks like because it's covered in this kind of plasticky material. But then that also causes it to trap moisture. And over time, these chips burn out. So they're like a notoriously faulty part. And now there are companies that make kind of clone versions of them because, you know, once you have it, you can take it off and do it. But when this was a new product, they didn't want anybody to steal it from them. Right. And I I want to say, before we get to this next part, I want to say um, the following, not just because I want things to go smoothly at Mainland Customs, but uh, because it it is true, uh, China is a font of innovation. Uh, China makes a ton of chips domestically on their own. They're just not the sophisticated chips, right? Uh, Mainland China makes them. Taiwan, of course, makes the world's best chips. Uh, so there, there is innovation happening in China. This 
scads and scads of it. But the U.S. government and U.S. companies in particular feel they have uncovered a pattern, a modus operandi. They What they see is that they want to do, like, let's say you're a car company and you want to start a factory in China, right? Because it's cheaper to manufacture some parts there. You will be required to partner with Chinese firms. You'll be required to hire Chinese nationals in certain key positions. And according to these critics, the entire time, these other companies you're partnered with and these um, employees, they are scooping up all the secret sauce, the manufacturing techniques, the proprietary strategies, all that junk. And then when they have um, extracted that intellectual resource, there we go, uh, then you're done. You know, you're an empty juice box. So boom, boom, boom. <laughs> they drink your milkshake. Right. Yeah. They drink your milkshake, yes. Well, so, so I'm trying to understand fully the relationship between China and Taiwan. So does China have unilateral control over Taiwan? You say that Taiwan disagrees, but – is China still basically top dog or is there a dispute even in that? And is that the, the tipping point that's, that's on the edge of that particular dispute? It's funny. It's funny. I'm looking at Matt's face because he's going, I, I can read your mind a little bit, Matt. Matt's like, how are we going to handle this one? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a great question. It's it a really, really good is. question. It's just difficult Unclear. to answer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because if you, it depends upon whom you ask, right? If you ask some politicians in Taiwan, then they will say, um, they'll, they'll give you probably one of three answers, depending on their ideology. They'll say uh, either one, yes, Taiwan is uh, 100% part of China, the way Alabama is 100% part of the US. Two, they'll say, um, we're going for a kind of, one country or one party, two systems kind of approach. So similar to how Macau and Hong Kong have cultural differences, but there's still, everybody admits they're part of China. Uh, Hong Kong was British until like 1999, but now it's officially Chinese. Um, or the third one, the hot one, the one that uh, gets those politicians in trouble, they will say, we are fighting for Taiwanese Independence and the government of China looks at that like uh, as though Fighting some words, yeah, as though somebody in the government of Alabama was going, Well, the kingdom of Alabama has always yeah, been it's like secessionism, <laughs> basically, yes, right? Or, 100%. Yeah, but, but to the outside perspective, especially since China isn't exactly forthcoming with this kind of information, it's sort of a black box, right. Like oh uh, yeah yeah okay so I'm I'm not alone in the, in in this confusion just making sure cool. dude no you're not alone you are you are with uh, we are together on this as is the majority of the world <laughs> there are some awkward conversations at the United Nations you know what I mean it's on the level of trying to uh, solve for uh, stability in the Middle East that's how sensitive this is. That's and, what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, dude. So the um, there was something that came out recently that I, I think everybody should check out. It was a CNBC documentary called China's Corporate Spy War. And it's an investigation into these U.S. allegations. I, I keep saying U.S. because there are main rivals in, in this exploration. But make no mistake, a lot of European countries feel the same way. And, of course... Korea and Japan and China will never get along unless like aliens land. They are not going to be friends. So in China's corporate spy war, um, this is about an FBI sting operation. Do you hear about this one? This, this surprised me. I don't know anything about this, but we can give you, I guess, a quote on a write up of this, Ben. I think that's what we're looking at, right? This is CNBC uh, talking about it. Yeah, it's it's about a um, a Chinese Ministry of State Security officer named Xu Yanjun, uh, who turned out to be a spy, and he wasn't spying on the U.S. government. He was spying on U.S. companies. Yeah, uh, and important companies with important technology like GE, Boeing, and Honeywell. 
Here comes the quote. Uh, in 2017, Xu Yanjun pursued an engineer at GE Aviation who had valuable knowledge of the company's jet engine composite fan blade technology. Posing as an Shoo. academic official and using a fake name, Xu was introduced to the GE engineer who was visiting Nanjing, China to give a speech at a prestigious university. Xu began a pressure campaign to get the engineer who had family in China to reveal more and more information about the engine tech the Chinese government had targeted. Mm. Hey, it's me, your friend, Johnny Last Name Blue Jeans. Hello, fellow kids. <laughs> it is I. Mm. Tell me of your skateboard tricks. Well, well like, I can't really tell you about the engine technology. That's a shame um, because I, I can tell you your grandmother's home address. That's right. Be a shame if something happened to Mimi. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, I, 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 it sounds like a snooze fest. You're talking about like composite fan blades technology right, right, and all this stuff, but it harkens back to one of my favorite songs. Do you guys remember Down Rodeo from Rage Against the Machine? I, I, yes, people ain't seen no, a brown no, skin man Rodeo since their the grandparents shotgun. bought one. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I guess we'll give you a small quote uh, from one of the verses here if I'm going to yeah. quote it correctly. Um, let's see. Let's. I, I, okay, I found it here. It's a thousand years. They had the tools. We should be taking them. F mm-hmm. the G ride. I want the machines the that machines, are making them. They're making right? them. Right. So yeah. that's what we're talking Never about. Caught here. that lyric. That's good. Yeah. But but that's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, China is attempting to get the keys. seize the means of production. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. The keys to production. Yeah. 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 And I love. I uh, God. I love a good. I love a good Rage Against the Machine. Uh, that is one of the bands cameo. of that era, I guess, that you would call rap rock or whatever that actually holds up because they were truly hip hop, like truly, you know, Zach uh, De La Rocha, incredible lyricist, Tom Morello, absolutely fabulous guitarist, and so many of those other bands that kind of came after them. Boo, but Rage yeah. holds up. Yeah, Rage holds up. They got a, they've got a great joint with uh, Run the Jewels. Zach De La Roca is on that. Um, anyway, ah, oh, they're not going to send us camping like they did my man for a Hampton. Ah, oh, Rage is so good. Anyway, yes, that and that's that's such a astute point, Matt. That's a beautiful point because the idea is about empowerment, right? Well, let's let's get to the Chinese perspective in just a second. In the case of this documentary, here's what the FBI did. The FBI alerted General Electric, and they said, you know, you're compromised. There's, there's a fox in the hen house, right? Uh, there's a fly in the ointment. And so they had this really weird meeting, and I think it was Cincinnati, with the engineer, and they confronted him, and they offered him the age-old classic choice. They said, you can face the legal consequences of breaking numerous laws, or you can keep doing what you're doing and just work for us. Which I guess just Easy means choice. L- alert the FBI of what information you're sharing and what instructions you're getting. Like that's literally it. And then the and then in turn the FBI will the way that you nailed it, the way this stuff works is you will report upon your activities so you give visibility right, into what the enemy forces are asking for, what they're prioritizing, composite fan blades, et cetera. And then as it gets a little more complicated as you get a little more switches in your chips of a subterfuge then you'll start feeding them fake information and the fbi will give you will give you either um they'll give you okay i don't want to go too deep into this but this is kind of interesting it's similar to how hollywood studios will control for script leaks they'll give um they'll give crew and cast different copies of a script with maybe certain lines tweaked or changed, certain watermarking things. Marvel does this or the mouse does this. And so they'll keep a record of that. And then if any of it pops up in the wild, they'll know exactly how to trace sort of the chain of custody. Very, very smart. Then they'll waterboard those jokers. We know you leaked the script. Tell us what you know. (laughs) (laughs) Take the water. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. Perfect. And if you get that reference right in, because uh, it'll make our, it'll make our evening. Uh, We're going to get a troll for that. (laughs) No, uh, surely not. Uh, There are bigger, 
bigger mice to fry. Uh, if we look at the Chinese perspective, just to be fair, the government of China has replied to this in various ways, uh, specifically to this case we mentioned from 2017 and to the idea of intellectual espionage in general. And they say it's pretty much xenophobic bull****. Uh, their embassy said, quote, the Chinese government has never participated in or supported anyone in any form in stealing commercial secrets. Some people and institutions in the U.S. have been making false accusations. We asked the U.S. side to handle the case without bias and in accordance with the law and protect the lawful rights and interests of Chinese citizens. Okay, totally sounds good, right? Sounds like a reasonable answer. Full disclosure, I did not know the word xenophobic until just now. Oh, yeah, not xenophobic, which is just... Xenophobic, yeah, this is new, this is new to me. Yes, it means obviously anti-Chinese sentiment or but more b- bigger than that, like, you know, on, on some kind of level of racism. Right. Like it mm-hmm. means the idea of like being uh, anti-Semitic. hundred percent. Towards yeah. Chinese people. Yeah. yeah, that's the idea. All right, guys, let's take a quick break. Hear word from our sponsor and come back with, I guess, more of the U.S. perspective on this whole situation. USA, USA, and I'm proud to be you. All right. So the U.S. perspective is this. (laughs) Washington has two big concerns. First, they are terrified that the Chinese government will catch up to the U.S. military or surpass it in key aspects. And thanks to what's called asymmetrical warfare, um, that is a valid concern. And secondly, they're very worried about uh, some some insult to injury. They think that uh, they think that China may leverage U.S. technology to do that. So st- so crib the secrets, steal the research, and then you're starting on third base for the next innovation. Right? You can do what's called technological leapfrogging, uh, and that's because President Xi Jinping said, "Look." China needs to be a world-class military by 2049. They're well on the way. Um, a big part of that push involves div- whoop. Sorry, I've got a I've got a lamp on a really janky hotel lamp. I've got lamps on lamps. Keep that part <laughs> in. All right. We're, sorry, we're on the road. But uh, okay, so a big part of their push involves developing autonomous weapons, hypersonic missiles, using machine learning or, you know, quote unquote, AI for all sorts of stuff, including cyber warfare and so on. For those of us playing along at home, to Matt's earlier point, to Noel's earlier point, what do all of those things need? Chips. chips. Delicious chips. <laughs> chips. They need the chips. <laughs> and uh, And China can't make the most advanced ones Yet, outside of Taiwan, no one can really make these super advanced semiconductors. So China has to play the international trade game. The U.S. has to play the international trade game, and they have to make nice. It's it's part of the reason they don't talk too much trash about Taiwan and China, because if they do... And if China decides to shut down the flow of the semiconductor spice melange, then it is just, it's going to be a storm. I know I'm cursing a lot in this one, but we can't overemphasize that. And the U.S. wants to block all the other stuff China needs to when the make chip hits chips. the fan, right? Yes, perfect. When the chip hits the fan, um, the Biden administration, uh, current U.S. President uh, Joe Biden, in October of last year, they put in, uh, they ratcheted up the trade war, and they said, "Look, we're not going to allow you to buy stuff with U.S. origins. If you are a U.S. based business, if you want to do business in the U.S." then you can't sell China certain things. And they went to the Netherlands and they went to Japan. Uh, uh, both countries have some pretty uh, pretty mission critical like manufacturing processes that are part of the semiconductor supply chain. And they got Japan and the Netherlands to agree. China is pretty pissed. They're pretty pissed about it. 
Yeah, President uh, Xi in particular has accused the United States of waging a Cold War style uh, series of containment strategies. Right. And um, he's not wrong, you know, but that's also that that, it's 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 one of the tools in the in the tool belt. Right. I mean, something has to be done. Wouldn't you say, Ben? I mean, this isn't an outright aggressive move. This is something that's like thinking ahead and trying to keep things from just ballooning out of control with this relationship. Right. Sort of like drawing a line in the sand. I, I don't know. Well, I, it's so weird to me because it's coming on the tales of news you've probably read about specifically about the U.S. If you're in the U.S. about Specific Chinese companies that were not allowed to do business with any anymore. We're not allowed to have their software on our hardware. <clears throat> TikTok, anyone? Uh, we're not allowed mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. use their hardware to access, you know, any networks. I mean, it's again, these are like, but it's almost like soft rules that are coming forward or bans. And it's very strange because the same thing is happening on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an escalating tit for tat. Uh, People are increasing, or sorry, these governments are increasingly trying to shut down points of access for for everything you need to make chips. Uh, And earlier this year, in response to U.S. actions, China said, look, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, they're U.S. companies. So Tupac style, they said, uh, you and anyone who rides with you <laughs> so uh, right doesn't if raytheon you- sound like a star wars monster i mean it really always mm-hmm. is. <laughs> just mm-hmm. it does to me hey we talked about it too like defense industries those companies have a weird habit of picking kind of aggro names i know you know it's true I mean? Like with but, but wouldn't you say that at this point, like our governments, you know, between China and America and, and the U.S. are like pretty openly distrustful and suspicious of one another. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's 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 gotten to the point where they're barely even trying to hide it anymore. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, that's why it's important to to understand both perspectives because they're raising valid points, even though they're both intensely nationalistic. It's their job. If you're a politician for a country, you need you're trying to rep your country's interest if you're doing if you're doing your job correctly. Uh, however, one of the issues is that China as a culture has a very long memory. The West has committed atrocities in China. The Opium Wars were entirely to force the people of China into becoming a nation of drug addicts. That's some not you know if you if you're uh, in the Chinese government. You're not going to forget that, and you should not. So, of course, they they don't trust each other. For a lot of these folks, the Cold War never ended. It's very much a zero-sum game. And the Chinese Ministry of Commerce, to that point about resource extraction, they just clamped down on gallium and germanium, uh, these two elements that you need to make computer chips, fiber optics, solar cells, etc. Right now, both sides are still having diplomatic talks, Janet Yellen went over there. As a matter of fact, Henry Kissinger went over to China in a surprise visit, and he kind of punked uh, U.S. politician John Kerry when he did it. Um, God, that Janet's always yelling. She needs to pipe down. <laughs> and uh, Just joking. That was a dad joke. That was a dad joke. I liked it. Thank no you. pun left Matt, behind. Matt's cringing with his hand in his head and just like shaking it. Matt's hoping his computer doesn't shame. explode. Well, that's <laughs> that's a very reasonable, <laughs> reasonable concern. <laughs> so here's why this is such a big, big problem. When push comes to shove, as diplomatic avenues get exhausted, two of the world's most powerful militaries, make no mistake, they will go hot for these chips if it's seen as a necessity. And they do have the capability to rain fire. It's not a good situation. And that's why war nerds on either side are already mapping it out. We don't have to get it. We're running a little long. We don't have to get into this war game. But if you have time and if you're interested, uh, check out Check out some work by a U.S. think tank called Center for a New American Security. Uh, There's a great New York Times article about it from last year. And they imagined this. They said, okay, what if three Taiwanese semiconductor foundries, not all of them, three of them, what if they just failed? What would happen? How would the world react? First, everything would go sideways. Secondly, 
the West would assume that there was some kind of cyber warfare, possibly from China. This would ramp up tensions, and there would be an international crisis as both countries attempt to secure their continued supply of chips and get control over over Taiwan, uh, real physical control. And what they found, don't let game fool you, these are world-class experts, what they found was outside of straight-up military intervention, the U.S. couldn't do much on its own. It's years away from making chips anywhere near the level of Taiwan. To your point, Noel, earlier, it might be impossible for them to catch up at this juncture. And one one line that really stuck out to us about this is, again, these are the world experts on this whole problem. They said the U.S. is more dependent on semiconductors now than it was on oil from the Middle East during the height of the fossil fuel glory days. And, you know, given what we were talking about too earlier in terms of how quickly this, you know, on the t- on a timeline compared to oil, our reliance on this stuff is, is very, is a blip, right? So that's why it's just not being talked about in the same way. We all understand about our dependence on oil. Everybody understands that that's its own thing because it's historically just a longer timeline. This has been an issue. It feels to me like your average person on the street has no idea what's brewing here. Mm, agreed. I mean, and, and before, you know, you can, we can dismiss this as alarmist, right? We can say, oh, people are doing performative political theater because they want more money for their think tank or their research or what have you. But before we dismiss this as crazy talk, let's all collectively remember what Uncle Sam did the last time people threatened oil supplies. This is no different. It's just a, a little bit more of a complicated supply chain. And hopefully that'll change. Right now, the re, you, you know, you could logically ask at the end of this, why hasn't Taiwan been the subject of an incursion, right, of a real hot war, invasion, takeover, look at me, I own the foundry now kind of situation. Mm-hmm. It's because of what's called the silicon shield theory. This industry is so important to Chinese manufacturers and so important to U.S. consumers that no one wants to tip the boat just yet. Like, imagine being stuck in an elevator. It's your only way out of the building, and you're there with someone you absolutely hate. Wow. <laughs> hey, um, this is kind of a non sequitur, but I'm just thinking about this episode overall. Oh, we love those. When I'm looking at the structure, like what we just talked about. Do you guys remember the Immortal Technique song... Uh, Peruvian cocaine. Yes. Great posse track. Okay. So I don't know uh, his work very well. Oh, I didn't well, check it out. Noel, uh, it is an amazing track that uh, literally tracks where mm-hmm. uh, cocaine originates in mm-hmm. like, in this case in Peru and then how it travels on mm. its way to the United mm. States, what entities so supply chain. Shit. Yeah. But, yes. but, it, <laughs> yeah. but it tells that story with different characters who are in that supply chain as it makes its way through. And it culminates with, you know, somebody on the street who's selling it and who ends up, you know, getting a long prison sentence for selling cocaine Big on the mouse street. Probably scared, not prepared to do years like Javier. Yeah. Dude, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we need, yeah. uh, this is a call out directly to you, immortal, uh, or Felipe. Um, we need more of that style song, like explainers of things like that for just everything. I want we we need it's like let's uh, start printing proving cocaine as a as a song type on different mm-hmm. topics like this one mm-hmm. and sugar and chocolate everything yeah 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 everything um, that's that's a great idea and. Um, now, of course, Immortal Technique may not be for everyone, uh, but even if you don't consider yourself a fan of hip hop, uh, even if you consider yourself, uh, even if you have some differences ideologically from that artist, is a very, very talented, very, very smart individual. And Peruvian Cocaine in particular is a song that is worth your time. Uh, it's, it just, oh, it slaps. 
God, you that's... might also know Jack White, you know, the, the singer for the White Stripes, and he's, he owns a record company. He owns uh, record pressing plants, and he named his solo tour uh, the Supply Chain Tour because it took place kind of like when there was all these issues with um, record pressing plants uh, being overwhelmed uh, because of, like, artists like Adele that were, you know, basically using up all of their bandwidth to print their, you know, massive, you know, huge selling records because vinyl is become a really popular medium now much much i think it's the highest selling physical medium of any anything cds are basically non-existent anymore but that's a supply chain too and it used to be that like the the plants that made vinyl records were all these old legacy plants and only just now have we started having smaller companies build new record pressing plants and that's sort of helping to take the the pressure off of these legacy ones but even still they can't build them fast enough and I'm only using this as a as a parallel to a, a much less, you know, uh, critical. You know, with, if we don't get our vinyl records, that's sad. That would make me sad. But it's not going to cause a war. But these things, these supply chain things, are are very real. Mm, similar and thing is, happening with helium. If we were going to talk about superconductors today, which we did not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the helium shortage, though, is is very real thing. Um, you should think about that every time you go in a grocery store and you see those birthday balloons. One day, they might be something you talk about, uh, and later generations say you're full of it. Why? Why would someone waste helium in a in a recreational balloon? Uh, the The issue is... With the uh, semiconductor shortages, um, the the issue is also it's very, very, very expensive to try to build new foundries. Not even the top notch ones, just foundries that can make you know pocket calculator chips. It's incredibly prohibitively expensive. It may lead to a war. We'll have to see how long the silicon shield theory holds. We'll have to hope that the U.S. and China can navigate a peaceful way out of this conundrum. Um, and of course, war and instability, statistically speaking at this point, they are on the horizon. It's due to a number of factors, destabilizing governments, rise of fascism and inequality, climate refugees, food crisis, water crisis, but semiconductor chips, those tiny, tiny things may well be the spark that sets the whole sets the whole party going. We can only hope that's not the case. We want to hear your thoughts. Gonna t- gonna try to bring up the intonation at the end to sound a little more positive. Big big thanks to semiconductors for making this show possible, and big big thanks to you for tuning in. Um, yeah, folks, what what do you think? Do you think this conflict would ever go hot? It seems like it'd be super terrible for the majority of the world. But uh, as the old quote goes, when elephants wage war, it is the grass that suffers. We can't wait to hear from you. We try to be easy to find online as long as our little transistors keep transisting. Ah, oh, the little transistor that could. Uh, you can find us uh, in a myriad of places on the uh, social network uh, platform formerly known as Twitter, uh, on YouTube, and on Facebook at the handle Conspiracy Stuff. On TikTok and Instagram, we're Conspiracy Stuff Show. Hey, you can also call us. Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. It's a voicemail system. You give mm-hmm. yourself a cool nickname. You say. Whatever you want for three minutes, just do include if we can use your name and voice on one of our listener mail episodes. If you've ooh, got ooh, more... Matt, yeah. Matt, Matt, quick interjection, though. I, I think um, some of our, our fellow listeners might enjoy this. Uh, we're big fans of the phone line, and I, I can't wait to hear the special voicemail uh, voicemail edition that you, you and Noel did. Um, also, confession, sometimes... I call the phone line myself. Really? <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to sift through. I've got more to do today on that. Um, oh, man. Ben, it's just... Brought, why did that bring... I was listening to way too much of Moral Technique. So um, it was Revolutionary mm-hmm. Volume 2, and it's yeah. point, of, point of No Return. That has Banger. some of the... Mo- just the best lyrics I've ever heard in my life. Like, so... So good. And for a conspiracy 
show that we make like those lyrics you're just like oh wait what did they find underneath the temple of solomon wait what uh what <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alexa, the name is not dude. coincidental yeah exactly yeah <laughs> oh man. yeah okay anyway um, uh yes i'm gonna check for you on the phone lines as well as everybody else and uh yeah if you don't want to do that stuff why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email we read everything that we receive we are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.